everybody! Welcome back to my video! Or welcome if this is your first video of me! My name's Link, here to give you part 2 of the secrets and references found in the new Netflix Filipino-inspired anime, Trese. Same warnings apply from the first one. I'm going to be spoiling the show 110%, so make sure to stream the show on Netflix before proceeding. And the stuff that I'm about to say are from my own interpretations of the myths based on where I grew up on. And folklore can vary from region to region. We cool? We cool. So, starting off with episode 4. This one, I can't believe I actually forgot to mention. The characters Alexander Wright and Anton for this episode are by Bayin. They were the traditional Filipino alphabet before the colonizers came and taught the ancestors the letters we know now. It was mostly for their convenience since they can't read our script, which could be said for most of the changes they made. Like in the past, people could just name themselves, but that became a headache for collecting taxes so they assigned official government names and forced Filipinos to only use those because they're boring like that. Yes, the Jeepneys. I assume these little things have a certain amount of infamy so I won't go hard into what they are, but I just gotta say, I'm kinda sad that the team made this one in particular so plain. While a lot of them are indeed old, they tend to have such festive colors and even personalized art. Names of the owner's loved ones plastered on the forefront or some inspirational quote. And that Jimmy driver must be having a bad day. Because I'm assuming Captain Guerrero's also traveling during the rush hour to get to work, and Jimmy's at these times, before the entire pandemic of course, are packed. Like hip to hip. Sardines will feel like they have it good with how squeezed people are in jeepneys. Being able to have that much space is a luxury during rush hours. And yes, due to the style of the jeepney, people will just pass their payments forward to the next person until it eventually reaches the driver at the front, and the process reverses if they happen to have some change. There are some instances where the driver has a helper called a conductor, and no, probably not the conductor you foreigners are thinking of. Something more similar to a barker that goes down the aisle collecting the payment for the driver, but I don't see them as often. Also, I'm assuming this is some movie magic shit because that jeepney is moving pretty fast. Where are the traffic jams? I wonder if foreigners were confused about these tombs since I don't really see it in any foreign media. But yes, people here do also like to paint their family tombs vibrant colors. Okay, this one confused the fuck out of me because the subtitle said, Anak ng inang buwakaw, tulungan ang mga namamatay, aguhon. Which means, child of a selfish mother, help those who die, compass. Which had me going, wait, whoa there, hold up. I don't know any gods known to be a selfish mother, and I doubt she could help us with this situation. But after I re-listened, the actual spell was, Anak ng inang bakal, tulungan ang mga naglalakbay. Aguhon! And that means, child of mother steel, help those who are traveling. Compass. Zombies aren't actually that common in Filipino culture, at least not in a part I grew up on. Ghosts and apparitions are more of the styles I hear about. Though, I have a sinking suspicion it's because even folklore wouldn't disrespect the dearly departed. Unlike ghosts like the white lady who in some way had a reason to stay with the living, zombies are basically vandalizing the remains of innocent ancestors who've passed and were hopefully at peace. And while there are ghosts that feed on our ancestors' corpses, zombies being someone's child or parent or loved one who didn't know any better and they get violated like this in their death by a fellow human, just isn't something the Filipinos can get behind. The stuff Tapia and the twins are getting is what we call taho. It consists of silken tofu, tapioca balls, and caramel syrup, and it's a staple during the mornings. They're peddled in this metal container suspended on a long pole as the seller walks on foot, and you can always tell when they're coming by the distinct call of Tao! I grew up on this shit. I was a regular that the seller knew me by name and would even give me extra caramel syrup. Sadly, I think the sellers have lessened in frequency as I remember a whole lot more of them when I was a kid. Also, I'm pretty sure the piece of bread Captain is giving Alexandra is a pandesal, another Filipino morning staple. They're slightly sweet, soft and fluffy bread. 
They're delicious when eaten freshly hot, to the point that holding a bag of them and feeling the warmth emanating is enough to put a smile on anyone's face. They're typically eaten with coffee. Either you dunk the bread in the coffee, or you tear it open and put something inside it. My parents like putting flavored mayonnaise in it, but I'm extra so I like putting in cheese. So I remember as a kid, I love putting margarine and sugar in it. Truly a diverse and versatile piece of breakfast bread. Hopping on to episode 5. God, why did they make the Aswang King so hot? People might have been confused by this scene, but basically the logic behind it is that the logo, redesigned for obvious copyright reasons, but it's supposed to be the main pharmaceutical store in the country, is a symbol that everyone looks up to for healing. And taking that associated energy from the symbol, she uses her power to heal Hank. This was all explained in the comics, but like I said in the first video, I don't have them on hand. She's not like somehow turning ibuprofen to magic Hank into safety. I was skeptical with this and this is definitely not the Coulomb I know of, but Alexandra specifically name dropped it so here we go. Coulomb is a type of Filipino witchcraft and are practiced by Manco Coulombs, literally meaning practitioners of Coulomb. While true that we get the occasional news of a Coulomb incident here and there, they're usually something petty like women in love triangles cursing her rival, which will usually result in the victim having some physical deformities or ending up physically ill. In some cases, even cursing their luck and fortune, there are also some cases where the kulam only works if the target has done any misdeeds, like if they were thieves or adulterous spouses. Usually, they'll need part of the victim, like some hair or toenail clippings. And they'll also use tools like beetles and things akin to voodoo dolls to bind their spells to their target. Usually, you approach an albolario or a witch doctor to find out what's wrong and hopefully a cure. They have ways similar to sitsayers and such to tell the cause and the culprit of the curses. And we'll use herbs and a method called hilod to heal the victim. And hilod is just a certain way of massaging the body but imbued with their magical powers. I can't say if it applies to everyone, but when I was a child, I received helots quite a lot, and I noticed the Albolaria didn't have any teeth. Though he was relatively young, like around 40 or 50 years old, too early to have teeth falling out. Since I was a kid, I rudely asked him why that's the case, and the adults told me it's because of his practices with helot, and so I thought that there was always a drawback to practicing it. Though, if that's legit, or they were all just fucking with me, I will never know. With all that, you can see why I didn't connect these acts to Kulam itself. Kulam is really more like a curse that causes harm to another person, and never have I heard it take control of people's will. Sure, the notion that these are all inmates and military men fits the bill for people who committed wrongdoings for the Kulam to take effect, but this to me just seems more like it's Talagbusao's powers rather than Kulam. Ha ha, Philippines no internet jokes. Ha ha ha. Alexandra's Chris, which we find out is named Sinag, and the name actually means like a ray or a beam of light. It's not so obvious in this picture, but I'm pretty sure Anton is wearing a barong Tagalog here. The reason why I said it's not so obvious it's because they're notoriously transparent, and I don't think the show doesn't have the means to portray that. In addition, the more opaque ones are actually considered lesser quality and hence for the poorer class, which by the look of the giant mansion, isn't the case. Barong Tagalog is a combination of pre-colonial and Spanish clothing styles. It's the national costume for men and is commonly made with pineapple or banana leaf fibers embroidered with elaborate designs. It's usually worn with black pants and a white undershirt, and are reserved for special occasions. This is something more of a hearsay at this point, so don't take this as fact. But there's an old legend that the reason it's a sheer piece of clothing is so Filipinos can't hide blades anymore, since Filipinos were fierce warriors and major knife nuts. Okay, now regarding what Alexandra and her mom's wearing, I had a good laugh out of it. 
What they're wearing is called a barot saya and is the national costume for women in the Philippines. It consists of several pieces of clothing, including the blouse, the skirt, a kerchief, and a shorter piece of cloth on top of the skirt. In the past, they were worn in daily life with fancier ensembles for special occasions. Needless to say, the dress has gone through many iterations over the centuries. And you can see that Alexander's mother is wearing the more modern and tight-fitting style of the barot saya. And the reason I had such a laugh was because not only was the barot saya little Alexandra was wearing the more traditional one, which makes no sense right next to her modern wearing mom, but the style in particular is of the lower class people. <laughs> little fun fact though, it's died down at this point, but back in the day, the sleeve, known as a kamisa, for the barot saya were a statement. Some geniuses thought to use cornstarch to make the sleeves stiffen, and it just became a trend for who can get the biggest sleeves. These golem looking things are mud elementals we call lamang lupa. They are very territorial in their lands and usually guard the harvest. If you want to plant in their lands, you make an offering of a red rooster that must be sprinkled on the rice paddies during the growing seasons, and it will destroy your crops if you don't fulfill the offering. Though, granted, with the metal forest that Manila is now, they have little rice paddies to guard. So in the story, they just eventually made a pact with the duendes and are now more akin to familiars to them. Accurate though. Jumping into the all-important episode 6, we finally get into the enigmatic Datu Talagbusaw. Datu Talagbusaw is an uncontrollable, bloodthirsty war god from Bukidnon, which is once again in Mindanao. Datu is a title that denotes to rulers like chiefs, princes, and monarchs. Though in our case, it's referring to an actual god. Though his name comes from the Visaya word Busawan, and that translates to a glutton. Historically, he's described to have large red eyes and wearing red garments. And already, you can see some differences but similarities to the animated version. Furthermore, he does have history of possessing the bodies of warriors to give them a power-up in battle to avenge a wrong done on them. But summoning him is also a double-edged knife, as he can drive his host insane with a thirst for the blood of pigs, fowls, and even humans. While it wasn't really explored in the anime, the comic did kind of twist that fact and said that he was summoned using the blood of pigs, fowl, and humans. There aren't really any accounts of him being able to summon weapons out of nowhere, and his regeneration is most likely just anime awesome effects. Though it isn't that unbelievable considering his status as a god. And to wrap all of this up, I want to go over the importance of Alexandra being a lakan and a babaylan and a woman. They're given the literal translations in the show, which is the warrior and the healer, but I'd like to go a bit deeper. A lot of sources are coming from Kaiju Kugel on Twitter, so all the credit goes to them. To start off on a bit of a sad note, a lot of Philippine history from pre-colonial era have been erased, and even to this day, historians are still scrambling to put our past together. I'll ask you to put a pin on that thought. Lakan is one of the highest titles a ruler can have. They weren't just kings or chiefs. They were believed to be divine rulers, either the embodiment of myths or descendants of Diwata. Something akin to a dryad. And if you've watched my first video, it's believed Maria Makiling was also a Diwata. Just to give you a hint of their divinity. And while sure the men outnumbered the women, women can be Lakan. Contrary to the misconception that they can't. Meanwhile, a babaylan in a simple term is a shaman, and are spiritual leaders for each community. It's strictly a feminine role, and I say feminine instead of female because there have also been records for effeminate men being babaylan, because pre-colonial Philippines never saw gender as binary. Their roles were integral to the community, as they were able to speak with the spirits as well as be the community doctor, and even step up as the leader when the datu is unavailable. Women were celebrated and respected before the Spaniards came. Yes, we are going back to that. Hope you held that pin! Like I said earlier, 
Spaniards changed everything about Filipinos to their convenience. And to spread Christianity, and ultimately make conquering the Philippines easier, they had to shame and demonize the Babaylans, one of their highest and most respected authority figures, to get their way. They presented their friars to have stronger spiritual abilities than their Babaylans, while at the same time desecrating all of their sacred items, trees, and areas to prove a point. And because it's Christianity, they stripped women of their titles and made them lower class than men, discouraging them from an uprising to reclaim their rightful place. And that is why Alexandra being a Lacan, a Babaylan, and a woman is so important. Kai Street perfectly captures how empowering and celebrated Alexander's role is. Seeing this woman rise up, be a pillar of a community, commanding respect and authority, yet still somehow kind and compassionate, to see her wield power ripped away from my ancestors, it fills me with a sense of pride and happiness that I can't really put into words. And that's it! Thank you so much for listening and for waiting this long for this second part. I really do hope if anyone found these interesting, then please spread the word about Trece around. It's so rare that we have Filipino animated media we can proudly show off. And also, thank you all so much for 100 subscribers. Look forward to more things I have in store for the future. Let's get that coveted 1k subscriber count. So as always, don't forget to leave a thumbs up if you liked the video and consider subscribing for all things weave and anime. Drop a comment down below on what you want me to cover next. Bye bye!